Hello everyone, welcome to IS Baba's 60 days rapid revision series for prelims 2022. This is day 46 and we take up economy topics. So some of the issues in the current affairs and also the government schemes are the topics of discussion. Before going to the topics, we take up the guessworks. So here the 25th one. So in India, the central banks function as the lender of last resort usually refers to which of the following. And first one, the lending to trade and industry bodies when they fail to borrow from the other sources, then providing liquidity to the banks having a temporary crisis, then tending to governments to finance budgetary deficits. So here friends, if you go with the words, so who is a lender of last resort? So that means, so I have been approaching several lenders, but no one has lent me. And if a person is the last resort, so that means he has lent me during the crucial times when no one was helping. So here why the banks will approach the RBI during a temporary crisis? So there are several other crediting agencies and there are share markets and capital markets to approach. So the last resort doesn't come during a temporary crisis. So eliminate two, we will get three only as the answer. So one step solution, 0.5 seconds. Then 26, R2 code of practices constitute a tool available for promoting the adoption of which of the following. So here, if you have some thought process regarding R2, so R2, RRR, so reduce, reuse and recycling. So somewhere it boxed down to the same thing and such things, they will be mostly related to environment and ecology, not for any other subjects. So if you think likewise, so here we have only one word recycling in all these options and straight away go and hit A as the option. So that is the maximum we can do again. So smartness works here. And even if you go to the knowledge perspective, even if you search hundreds of websites, you won't get this because this is present somewhere in, in the UNFCC website, but that is not present in the front of the website. So we have to open this document to search that. Then come to next. Why is there a concern about copper smelting plants? So they may release lethal quantities of carbon monoxide into the environment and the copper slag can cause the leaching of some heavy metals into the environment and they may release sulfur dioxide as a pollutant. So here may, can and may. So all these, they prove the moderate statements, but here one word that lethal quantities. So this sounds to be extreme. So else we would have considered all of the above. So here, if you go with the last year's answer key, we had seen that the word using. So that was the keyword in the benzene pollution question. And here, if you consider that, so two and three only will be the option, but going with the knowledge. So here it is like friends, carbon monoxide itself is a poisonous gas. And even a small amount of carbon dioxide, so that can be lethal. So if you consider that, so all of the above will be the option. So here we will go with two and three only and we will see what UPSC gives. So one or two questions, even if they go wrong, we need not worry about that. Then come to next with reference to furnace oil, consider the following. So it is a product of oil refineries and then some industries use it to generate the power. Then its use causes sulfur emission into the environment. So here it is like say all the statements are moderate and here you have the advantage of doubt in favor of you. Say for example, it is a product of oil refineries. It is impossible to prove that it is not a product of oil refinery and some industries use it to generate power. So somewhere in some part of the world, if any one industry uses it for generation of power, the statement becomes true and its use causes sulfur emission into environment. So even if 0.1% of quantity of sulfur is emitted, it is emission itself. So here we don't have any other confusions. So we go with all of the above as the answer. Then what is blue carbon? So a very easy question, option A. So here we need not discuss so much and the knowledge comes before the guesswork here. Then in nature, which of the following is or are most likely to be found surviving on a surface without soil? So here we have ferns, then lichen, mosses, then mushrooms. And friends here, the options given are skewed. So it is not as per our understanding. Say for example, ferns. So they have some vascular bundles within them. So their stems, they have primitive xylem and phloem tissues. And so that prompts them to be present on the soil. And here, if you take that, the one should not be there. So two only or two and three only will be the formidable options. But we know that mushrooms, so they can survive even on dead animals, dead plants and others. They need not require soil. So four is not present in these two. So here again, if we go through the options, so it is an indication that examiner's thought process is completely different from what we are thinking in this question. 
so that is why instead of causing more confusion and delaying and consuming the time here so we will make sure that we will leave this question so this question was worth to be left because by the options we can see that there is a significant difference between our thought process and the intent behind the examiner who set the question so that is why we will leave this we will not attempt this and once the answer key comes we will see what the UPSC examiner's answer key is. Then come to next to the topic. So rubble currency. We have been seeing the Ukraine-Russia war. So in that context, the rupee rubble trade agreement comes into picture. So what is this rupee rubble trade agreement? It is a payment mechanism which can allow Indian exporters to be paid in Indian rupees for their export to Russia instead of standard international currencies such as dollars or euros. Friends, this comes into effect because so the US, UK and European Union, they have levied sanctions on Russia and Russia doesn't have hard currencies now. So there are no dollars, sterling pounds in Russia's account. And now it is difficult for Russia to procure our goods or any other goods for that matter. And in this context, the rupee rubble trade becomes very, very crucial. And under this arrangement, a Russian bank will need to open an account in an Indian bank. Well, an Indian bank will open its account in Russia. And both the sides can then mutually agree to hold currency worth a specified amount in the local currencies in their respective accounts. Say for example, if the agreed amount is say 100 million dollars, so the Russian rubble worth 100 million dollars will be deposited in the Indian bank and Indian rupees worth 100 million dollars will be deposited in Russian bank. So now, so now whenever there is imports or exports, so both can mutually pay in the local currencies. So this is how the rupee rubble trade occurs and India successfully used the mechanism for partly paying for its oil purchases from Iran. So even during the US sanctions on Iran, so we had gone for the Iran-India trade on the local currencies. Then it is important to have an alternative payment mechanism as the US, European Union and UK have blocked at least seven Russian banks from accessing the SWIFT mechanism. So we know that SWIFT is an international channel of banking so when this is blocked we cannot go for hard currency trades then come to next the non-fungible tokens so here where bitcoin was held as the digital answer to the currency and now these non-fungible tokens are now being touted as digital answers to the collectibles so the statement seems to be complicated we will see fungible asset is something that can be readily interchanged like money say for example i give you two rupees or I give you two one rupee coins. So both are same. And however, if something is non-fungible, it is impossible. That is, it has unique properties. Hence, it can't be interchanged with something else. So I cannot exchange one painting with the other. So I cannot give my painting and take back Mona Lisa's painting. So Mona Lisa painting is much more work than the painting I have done. And everything from our drawings, photos, videos, and musics, etc. So they can be traded using the cryptocurrencies if you go for these non-fungible tokens. But what makes NFTs unique from other digital forms is that it is backed by blockchain technology. So now we got to know that these non-fungible tokens are something which are related to the antique pieces, then sale of photographs and others. So here that intellectual property related to our creativities. So that is being valued and here how it actually works. So, the traditional works of arts such as paintings are valuable and they can't be duplicated. And the digital files can easily be and endlessly duplicated. And now with the NFT tokens, the artwork can be tokenized to create a digital certificate of ownership that can be bought and sold. And as with the cryptocurrency, a record of who owns what is stored on a shared ledger known as blockchain. And for instance, if you are a sketch artist and if you convert your digital asset into a NFT, what you get is the proof of ownership powered by blockchain. And here, the Twitter's founder, that is Jack Dorsey, he has promoted an NFT for the first ever tweet with the bits hitting 2.5 million. Friends, now we have discussed all about these non-fungible tokens, but we didn't get the clarity that what is actually these non-fungible tokens are. Say for example, I have done a painting and now I have monetized that. Say for example, I have pledged some 50 NFTs that is non-fungible tokens. So now when a person buys it, so he will give these 50 NFTs and how he pays these 50 NFTs. So he will pay as per the current hard currencies rate for one NFT. 
Say for example, one NFT now, the current rate is say $5 and now he will pay me $250 and he will purchase that. And now this becomes fixed. That is, I have painted that and I have monetized it for the 50 NFTs and now this person, Mr. X, he has purchased that for the 50 NFTs and now two blocks are created as per the blockchain technology. That is one block for me. That is, I am the owner. And now the ownership is being transacted to the person X. So this is how the NFTs work. Then come to next, the federated digital identities. So here, the proposal for this federated digital identities is a part of Electronics and IT Ministries India Enterprise Architecture 2.0, that is India 2.0 framework. So what it is? So as various government platforms across domains are being digitized, so there is a tendency to create more IDs each with its own ID card and ID management and efforts to make it unique. So for example, we have the voter IDs, we have other cards, we have PAN cards and others. So how to make it federated? That means how to make it unified. So here India 2.0 proposes a model of federated digital identities that seeks to optimize the number of digital identities that a citizen needs to have. So if all the database are stored in within one and if all are interconnected, with the help of one identity card, I can correspond or coordinate with n number of government departments. So here, for example, when a beneficiary is registered for the PDF scheme, that record will be linked to the Aadhaar by PDF system. And now the information is stored in Aadhaar. So now, instead of giving the ration card, by giving the Aadhaar card, he can get the PDF ration. And similarly, when someone obtains a PAN, so that record gets linked to Aadhaar again. So here, instead of submitting PAN card, so for the other card itself, so the income tax can be filed and he can claim the refunds. So all these will happen only if the India 2.0 is full-fledgedly established. So this is about the federated digital identities, then the Sagar Parikrama. So this scheme was launched by the Department of Fisheries, that is Ministry of Fisheries and Animal Husbandry. And this scheme aims to facilitate interaction with the fishermen, then coastal communities and stakeholders so as to disseminate the information of various fisheries related schemes and programs being implemented by the government. So this is an information dissemination platform. So here we are not funding anything. We are just creating awareness about various government schemes. So mark this as important that is awareness creation. Then promote responsible fisheries with the focus on sustainable balance between the utilization of marine fisheries and also food security of the nation and the livelihood of coastal fisher communities. Then it also aims for the protection of marine ecosystem and also to uplift the fishermen's life by integrating with the Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana and also the FIDF. So again, it is an awareness creation program that if you remember, it is more than sufficient. Then integration of e-mandis into enam platform. So we have various mandis, the APMC yards, and that is being integrated to the ENAMs. So that means, so in any APMC yards in the country, so if you go, there will be a screen and they will show you that in this state, so this vegetable is costing this much or the rate for this product is this much. So now you can tie up and you can sell your product, say from North India to any state in South India or to any APMC Mandi to the South India. So this is how that integration of e-Mandis with the ENAMs. And currently 450 new mandis have been integrated and as per the union budget, so additional 1000 mandis are to be integrated with the ENAM platform. Then more about the ENAM. So here ENAM was launched in 2016 as a pan India electronic agriculture marketing or trade portal linking the APMCs across the state. So we know that ENAM means one nation, one agriculture market. Then it is managed by the small farmers agribusiness consortium. So market as important and then ENAM provides for contactless remote bidding and mobile based anytime payment for which traders do not need to either visit the mandis or the bank for the same. So by sitting in their own place, they can make the payments and they can also bid and it networks the existing APMC mandis to create a unified national marketing for agriculture commodities. So indirectly, we are going to fulfill the dream for which the ENAM platform was being set up. Then. Come to next, India's first water taxi service inaugurated in Maharashtra. So again, a simple fact, India's first water taxi was inaugurated and with a budget of 8.37 crores. So a bit costly project and 
the three routes including the belapur to ferry wharf and then belapur to elephant caves and belapur to jnpt so these are the three routes for which the water taxi has been launched and inaugurated and in the initial stage seven speed boats will run on these routes and ease of transport is a key factor so that is why this will help in the ease of transport and this will become a new way of infrastructure in future then come to next the automatic generation control so by the word itself it shows that whenever a power is generated so automatically this power will be controlled say for example in one power house there is excess of generation and in other there is a shortage so now this automatic generation control it will manage and it will make sure that there is a smooth flow of electricity in the grids so here union ministry of power dedicated this automatic generation control to the nation and through this agc the national load dispatch center sends signals to more than 50 power plants that is more than 50 power houses in the country every 4 seconds to maintain the frequency and reliability of the indian power system so the signals will be going on continuously to make sure that so the smooth flow of electricity is maintained so neither there is a clog nor there is a paucity of current then this will ensure more efficient and automatic frequency control for handling variable and intermittent renewable generation friends these renewable energies that is the wind solar etc they are not consistent they are intermittent it depends on the speed of the wind and the amount of incoming solar radiations that are coming so hence this automatic generation control will be very helpful then this is expected to facilitate achieving the government's 500 gigawatt target for the renewable energy then the agc is being operated by the power system operation corporation through the national load dispatch center so the posoco is operating this automatic generation control so what is this posoco friends it is a psu and it is a subsidiary of power grids and this works but obvious under the ministry of power and it is responsible to ensure the integrated operation of grid in a reliable efficient and secure manner and it consists of five regional load dispatch center and the national load dispatch center so remember the posoco it is a subsidiary of power grid then come to next the smart cities and academia towards action and research that is the sar program so under the smart cities mission the ministry of housing and urban affairs has launched the smart cities and academia towards action and research program and it is a joint initiative of ministry of housing and urban affairs the national institute of urban affairs and the leading indian academic institutions of the country so basically it is the intelligentsia academy a link so basically we can say it is a think tank and under the program 15 premier architecture and planning institutes of the country will be working with the smart cities to document the landmark projects undertaken by the smart cities mission so what and all the projects that are being taken up those will be documented then these documents will capture the learnings from the best practices and they provide opportunities for engagement on the urban development projects to the students and it also enables real time information flow between urban practitioners and academia so the smart cities are coming up with various projects and the students in various institutes they are going to learn and they are going to exchange the knowledge with these best practices so that is all about this sar then come to next india becomes asia's second largest economy by 2030 so here ihs market so it said in a report that india is likely to overtake japan as asia's second largest economy by 2030 and here currently india is the sixth largest economy behind us china japan germany and uk so remember this order us china japan germany and uk then india's nominal gdp is forecast to rise from 2.7 trillion dollars in 2021 to 8.4 trillion dollars by 2030 and by 2030 indian economy would also be larger in size than the largest western european countries of germany france and uk a very good forecast and then the long term outlook for the indian economy is supported by a number of key growth drivers so what are those an important positive factor is its large and fast growing middle class which is helping to drive the consumer spending so we know that india was a good market and it continues to be a good market because of the consumption class then the country's consumption expenditure will double from 1.5 trillion in 2020 to 3 trillion by 2030 then the indian economy is forecast to continue growing strongly in 2022 23 
at a pace of 6.7 percent and its large industrial sector have made India an increasingly important investment destination for the multinational companies. So in various sectors, the companies are eager to invest in India. So all these prospects, they predict that India is going to become the second largest economy by 2030. Then the submission on agriculture mechanization. So here we have amended this project so that we will have a more precise mechanization of agriculture sector. That is this program envisages for granting up to 100% of cost of agriculture drone or rupees 10 lakh whichever is less for grant of purchase of drones. So if you are purchasing the drones, if it is less than 10 lakh, so 100% funding and if it is more, so 10 lakh will be funded, remaining is our expenditure. And in this context, the application of drones should be discussed because this was asked in the 2020 prelims. So here the plant counting, so that means how many plants have to be planted within a given plot and then the plant height, so to what height it grows and to what extent we have to make sure that the sunlight availability is there and then the vegetation indices that is the leaf area then if there are any anomaly so the diseases pathogens etc then the needs of the water and any damage regarding the water supply so all these are to be assessed by these drones and for the more applications so we have optimized inputs so that is how much seeds fertilizers and water should be applied and how to remove the weeds and pests and fungi so to what extent they are the threats and then the treatment and actions if there are any diseases and then real time mapping and precise calculation of the yield. So all these are various advantages. So just here remember like the SMAM project so that has allowed for the purchase of drones that is more than sufficient. Then the domestic systematically important insurers. So IRDAI Insurance Regulatory Development Authority of India has identified the Life Insurance Corporation of India then the General Insurance Corporation of India and the New India Assurance Co. as the domestically important insurers for 2020-21. So for this year, so these three insurance companies, they have been designated as the DSIIs. And here some of the important takeaways. The three public sector insurers shall raise the level of corporate governance and identify all relevant risks and promote a sound risk management culture. So that means if we have designated these, so they will set a benchmark for the corporate governance and all these domestically important insurers. So they will also be subjected to enhanced regulatory supervision. So IRDAI will keep a watch on these and it will make sure that these companies will perform exceptionally good. And then the DSIIs shall be listed on an annual basis. So every year these companies will list their stocks in the share market. So friends, these are the three important ways in which the domestic systematically important insurers will be treated separately compared to other insurance companies. And now what are the criteria on which these domestic systematically important insurers are being categorized? So it may be on the size in terms of total revenue. So if a company is coming up with more revenue then the premium underwritten. So whether it is having a good premiums and the value of assets under management. So if it is having more assets, more policies for that matter. So all these are some of the criteria. So all these are specific to the insurance companies. We need not dwell into so much of detail. Then more facts. So these DSIIs. So they refer to insurers of such size and market importance and other domestic and global interconnectedness. And also their continued functioning is critical for uninterrupted availability of insurance services. And these DSIIs are pursued as insurers that are too big or too important to fail. So that means they are too big a system that they will never fail. So friends, very similar to the domestic systemically important banks. So here the systemically important insurers, the only that difference and make sure that those three PSUs you will remember and some of the criteria and how they are differently treated. So this, if you remember, that is more than sufficient. Then the model insurance villages, the IRDAI has mooted the concept of model insurance village to boost the insurance penetration in rural areas. So what is this concept of model insurance village? So the idea is to offer comprehensive insurance protection to all major insurable risks that villagers are exposed to and make available covers at the affordable or subsidized costs. Friends, different villages have different risks. Say for example, fishermen are most vulnerable to the tsunamis. But at the same time, the farmers in arid area, 
they are susceptible to the drops so likewise the differentiation of insurance will be the key criteria of this model insurance villages then in order to make the premium affordable the financial support needs to be explored through nabards and other institutions and even the csr that is the corporate social responsibility funds can also be utilized and the government support and the reinsurance company support can also be taken so mainly we need to have some good source of funds so that the premium will be reduced and it will be affordable for the poor villagers then the possible offerings so what are the features of this model insurance villagers so here the weather indexed products so all the insurances so that will be indexed for weather so if something happens in a normal weather more premium will be paid and if something happens in a worse weather so less premium will be paid so that farmers should know that the weather is already riskier so that weather indexing is one of the key features and then flexible farm insurance packages targeting comprehensive needs of the crops livestock then farmers and farm implements so here a flexible package will be given that means if the livestock is being destroyed or if the tractors are being destroyed or if there is a ill health for the farmers so for everything one insurance policy can pay and then separate products for high value agriculture then contract farming and corporate farming communities so different policies for different kinds of farmers and then states can be offered macro insurance covers based on the predefined parameters so here it is like one state will be having its own risk so for those risks so we have to make sure that the insurance will be separately provided so this is about the model insurance villages then come to next the anti trust so google is abusing its market position by unfairly promoting its mobile payment app that is the google pay in the country and in 2018 the competition commission of india fined the google rupees 21 million dollars for such bias that is the search biases so if you search in the google play app the google pay comes for the first because it belongs to google company and then what is anti trust law so here the anti trust law also referred to as competition law aims to protect the trade and commerce from unfair restraints and monopolies and the price fixings and it ensures that fair competition exists on an open market economy then the competition act 2002 is india's anti trust law and it repealed the mrtp act so here remember friends that is the anti trust law of india is nothing but the competition act itself so that fact is more than enough here and we know that google is being coming up with the competitional mal practices since last decade and that is not so important for us here so remember the competition act and the anti trust law and try remembering raghavan committee then come to next the special purpose acquisition companies so here government is exploring a legal framework for special purpose acquisition companies in order to pave the way for the indian companies to be listed through this method in future as per the recommendations of the company law committee 2022 so here these special purpose acquisition companies so they are only to acquire some shares so here yes pscs are the special purpose companies with no commercial operations and funded only for the purpose of raising funds through an initial public offering or acquiring or merging with another company and these spcs is sometimes known as the blank check firms so market is important have been around for decades but have seen a surge in popularity in the recent years and once the funds have been raised from the general public they are held in an exclusive account and that can be accessed during the acquisition process so for example i am going up with a company and now i will raise the funds and all these funds will be in the exclusive account and if i don't acquire any company if i don't purchase any land and if i don't start the company per se the fund will be refunded back to the investors so this happens only if i have some face name say for example any celebrity if they come up and if they open this spsc then so many funders will be eager to fund and if there is no face value then there will be no funds acquired so now if i go to the market and pledge so no one will invest but if a celebrity comes and pledges so many people will invest and he or she can open his or her own company with those funds and here we can see that the serena williams and then alex rodriguez so all have opened up this spcs and they have invested so that is why this has gained currency in the market so just understand what is this spcs 
and how it will function that is more than sufficient then the climate smart cities assessment framework the cscaf 2.0 so it was launched by ministry of housing and urban affairs so market as important and the cscaf initiative intends to inculcate a climate sensitive approach to urban planning and development in india so the name of the scheme the ministry and the intent is more than enough for prelims then the objective of the cscaf is to provide a clean road map for the cities towards combating climate change so what obvious the climate sensitivity comes with an aim to combat climate change then the climate center for cities under the national institute of urban affairs is supporting the ministry of housing and urban affairs in implementing this cscaf then what are the frameworks so here energy and green buildings then urban planning then green cover and biodiversity then mobility and air quality then water management so these are some of the criteria on which the climate smart cities assessment framework is cashing on so this is all about today then come to the last part friends we have been seeing that starting from health education insurance or for business establishment for that matter so government is eager to spend for the citizens so if the citizen is proactive if he is knowledge if he is really hard working so government is the real parent but the thing is that that inner resolution to succeed and work hard so that should come within the citizens so when citizens become such a knowledge entities so what obvious there are no possibilities why india will fail and there are no possibilities why india will remain to be a developing country and we will be in the zenith one day but the only thing is that the mindset of the citizens should change so in this context we will have a better mindset of our own and we shall also create awareness with the fellow citizens to have an inner motive to strive for excellence so all the very best good luck friends